if he had taken one of the stuffed birds, you know, that had gotten close ups. If he had taken the book, if he had taken the TV, but this blue end table, and I'm thinking, does he just like that color? Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shuklistan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you today? I am unpacking all my white clothes, since now we are allowed to wear white clothes <laughs> after Labor Day. I mean, after Memorial Day. <laughs> I do not allow myself to wear very many white clothes because they do not stay white for very long. Yes, and I will be breaking out the barbecue and various and sundry buntings of red, white, and blue. Sounds good. You know, for me, this weekend is Indianapolis 500 weekend. And as a native Hoosier, the race runs thick in my blood. As does the diesel fumes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a good weekend. You know, it's also like like the traditional traditional, even though dates kept getting pushed forward the traditional start of the summer movie season and so we are having movie club today film club fran is back to discuss fox catcher the movie based on the book that we read for our most recent book club the uh mark schultz story of how uh john dupont uh murdered his brother dave and uh it stars steve carell as john dupont and Channing Tatum as Mark Schultz and Mark Ruffalo as Dave Schultz. Take a listen to our conversation. Movie Club! Fran, welcome back. We're talking Foxcatcher. What do you have for us? Well, today we are going to talk about Foxcatcher, which came out in 2014, and it stars Steve Carell as John DuPont, an eccentric uh, millionaire, and Channing Tatum and Mark Ruffalo are a pair of brothers who are wrestlers. It is based on a true story of the two brothers who um, are Olympians. They're gold medalists uh, from Los Angeles in 1984 in freestyle wrestling. And it's the story of how these two brothers became associated with John DuPont, who is a millionaire so spoiler alert, um, unfortunately, you know, after the two brothers associated with Mr. DuPont, in the end, Mr. DuPont ended up killing Dave Schultz, which is the older brother, in front of his wife and a security person uh, on the property. And he ended up going to prison uh, for the crime. So in the beginning, you know, it, the thing that struck me is the the tone of the movie was very somber and very serious, very slow. It's not the kind of movie that I usually enjoy watching. I, I really like something that has a little faster pace. This was very, it felt very calculated. It felt very uh, slow moving plotting through actually so it was actually a little tough to watch I felt like and I didn't quite understand I, I did not try to really get the storyline beforehand I just wanted to watch it evolve on the screen so I didn't really know much about anything that was going to happen so I was just kind of waiting for you know some eventual you know big circumstance that happened between them because I knew something big happened I think the actors did a wonderful job uh, portraying these characters. However, you know, I, I didn't like anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they weren't really likable people, really. So I, I think it's interesting that you say it felt calculated because that, to me, the director kind of got John DuPont, who was calculating all these moves along the way and had that tone throughout the movie mm -hmm. that that I thought was kind of inter interesting. So I saw it in the theater when it came out and didn't know a ton about Mark Schultz and Dave Schultz. 
And then we read the book and I watched it again. It was it was interesting to have the knowledge of the book with me because it's almost part of the problem because Mark Schultz's book is not very good. Mm. It's very, you know, what we talked about in book club is how skewed Mark Schultz's perspective was. Okay. And one of the things that I complained about in that book is I would really have liked a third party view. Mm. And the way this movie is constructed, even though Mark is the central figure in the movie, it is more of a third party view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I definitely felt like I was getting, in a strange way, a much more complete picture. Mm -hmm. And yet, I wondered how anyone could know what the heck was going on if you hadn't read the book, because there were so many missing pieces. The way this movie unfolded, it was almost like a series of vignettes. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Just, like snapshots. And even they did like a fade to black between right. sections. And I would have been confused. I remember as I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, okay, so in the book, this is where we are. But what you mentioned about the acting, the physicality of all three of the main mm -hmm. actors was so good. When Channing Tatum first appears on the screen and he has that almost Neanderthalish stance and walk uh -huh. and uh -huh. method of eating was brilliant. And, and Mark Ruffalo's sort of gentle yet still hulking quality to him, no pun intended, as uh -huh. he's also played uh -huh. the Hulk. And then that you know, that, as you said, the very calculating movements of Steve Carell. Right. Was, I think, what made me feel like I was getting a, a, a fuller picture of the story. But I didn't know what the heck was going on, and I read the book. But it's it's unfortunate because, and I don't know if, if Mark goes into this in his book, but, you know, when you first meet Mark in this movie, like you said, he's very quiet. He doesn't talk that much. Neanderthal just shows things through his movements, you know, and doesn't really talk that much. So then I was thinking to myself, okay, is he slow? Is he autistic? You know, what, wh who is this person? And it, it almost seemed like he was very simple, but then, you know, you learn that he went to college and I'm like, okay, well, he went to college. And then when I started doing some research online and I was reading some clips of, of things that he said, his clips were very articulate. So I'm like, okay, well, this doesn't seem like the same person that was portrayed in the movie. I got that impression as well. I thought they portrayed him as intellectually disabled in some Correct. way. Yeah, that's how I felt. I'm like, huh. is this, you know, you know, it, it just seemed like that because it seemed like also that Dave was always the protector. You know, he always felt like he had to protect his brother and do things for him. And I was thinking, well, why isn't he doing things for himself? I mean, he was a an Olympic champion. Yeah, he did that one talk in front of the kids in the beginning of the movie, but he didn't seem thrilled to do it. So, you know, was he down on his luck? Was he, you know, did he have no skills? You know, why, why wasn't he doing something other than, you know, sitting in his second floor apartment, eating day old food like, by himself? <laughs> I, I think it's a combination of all of that. Because one of the things in the book seemed to be that he didn't have very many friends. So he shuttled back and forth between parents a mm -hmm. lot mm -hmm. growing up. And then when he was a competitor, he just had this focus on himself kind of and did not want to necessarily get to know his teammates. And I think that was part of the, the book that you got the sense that he was just kind of I am an island kind of guy. And I think what in the movie, it makes it look like, oh, he's living in his brother's shadow, which is kind of part of it. Hmm. And then also he's very poor because wrestling doesn't pay anything. Right. And, and then I think for him, that was it. Like, didn't think much beyond what am I going to do when I'm done with my competitive athletic career? Uh -huh. You know, maybe he figured he'd go on and coach, but there just doesn't seem to be much to him necessarily right. personality wise. Right. You know, and he plays I, his, his his Game Boy, and that's probably about it, and watches TV. And it was very strange how, you know, all of a sudden, like, he gets this phone call, 
from John DuPont about wanting to meet him. And I'm like, this is just very strange. You know, it almost felt avant-garde, you know, how he gets in this <laughs> helicopter. And, and I'm just like, well, where did he start out from? And then I had to, I Googled where his brother was working and I'm like, okay, they're in Massachusetts. Okay. And then I'm like, well, why did he take a plane to Pennsylvania <laughs> and then a helicopter? Well, in, in reality, he was in California. Oh, he was in California. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so if you want to talk about like factual, like Foxcatcher is just above gold in what's <laughs> actually true in this movie because they compress the timeline so much. Yes, that and, I and, noticed. And things did not happen exactly when it looks like in the movie. And part of the issue of kind of Foxcatcher the book is that Mark and Dave were never at Foxcatcher Farms at the same time. Oh, really? So they had to put them together oh, to heighten harder. the plot of the movie. So, of course, Mark did not know what was going on while Dave was there, necessarily. Oh, so, that shock. Because yeah. that, that was definitely not portrayed the same way in the movie. No. It, it, in the movie, it almost felt like the reason for the murder is because... Dave gets in between John and Mark's friendship. Right, right. Like that's the motivation for the murder. Whereas in the book, the only motivation that Mark talks about is that Dave was going to leave the farm. Oh, interesting. So it's a very different presentation of why the murder happened. Right. And I think online when I was trying to research it and see like legitimately, like, was there any other resources on it? And they said they really don't know exactly why he did no. what he did. That is really interesting that they weren't together at the same time, because one of the things I was curious about was, you know, Mark was there at the beginning training with DuPont and the other uh, wrestlers. And then Dave did not want to go train at the facility and he wanted to stay where he was with his family and then all of a sudden he showed up and I was like well why you know he was so emphatic about not wanting to be there and then all of a sudden he showed up and he wanted to participate so that was just kind of a weird like all of a sudden his whole family moved out to Foxcatcher when before he would never want to do that so I just thought that was just kind of a weird change to the movie now it could have been that one of his co his coaching gig ended and he needed a job and Foxcatcher Farms was always there for him. Okay, that would make so, more sense. you know when you have a family. Sure, John Dupont's going to offer you a ton of money. Sure, he's already made a name for himself in the wrestling world as this huge benefactor. Uh huh. So you get a place to live, you get to train, you get great facilities. Right. You get you know, it's it's worth going to. And Not he was there thing. for years, too. That's the other thing that it doesn't really seem because because right. the timeline was so compressed. Right. You don't necessarily see all the years. And Dave was going to make a comeback in wrestling. And you don't see that really either. Oh, that's interesting. Right. So the, the other question of the time compression is when so Mark left Foxcatcher at the very end of 1988. And Dave comes to Foxcatcher in 89. The murder doesn't happen until 96. Mm -hmm. So his children were very, very young when he moved to Pennsylvania. So in the movie, Mark Ruffalo's Dave Schultz says, my kids are in school. I don't want to move them. Well, they weren't. Oh. They weren't really in school until they went to Pennsylvania. So. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you would have to go through a whole multiple chapters of Dave was a coach at Stanford and he had a contract yeah. and he had committed and he and Nancy had just gotten married and he didn't want so all of the and he had always lived in California hmm. so didn't want to move. But the the movie makes it seem like all of these events happen within maybe an eighteen month mm, right, period, right two years right. at most when really it was more like close to ten years right. It just seemed very weird, like the whole scenario of, you know, Mark with John. And you can see that, you know, John, it, they portrayed John DuPont as this eccentric, 
very wealthy person with just weird kind of affect and just you could tell he just was not a well-liked person and you know they they made a point to to talk about how you know the only person that was his friend when he was young was this other the chauffeur's kid and he, he found out later that his mother had paid him to be his friend and and I mean the way you know that he portrayed him you could see why he was just a weirdo you know, I don't know how how true to life he was, but he just seemed very, very odd. And then the question I had, too, and the way it was portrayed in the movie, there almost seemed to be a little bit of a sexual tension between Mark and John. And they didn't overtly, you know, do anything sexual, but it just seemed like you just kind of had that feeling like, was there this kind of almost sexual tension in the room between them? You know, there was that odd scene where uh, John showed up and asked Mark to wrestle. And it was like middle of the night and they're in the, the wrestling room in the dark going through moves and you're just going, you know, what the heck, you know, this is just really weird. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and you, you may have seen that in the research you did because it's one thing that Mark Schultz didn't like. He There were times where he really liked the movie, then times where he really didn't like the movie. Mm-hmm. And he seemed to flip back and forth on a dime too, and he did not like the sexual undertones mm-hmm. of a possible relationship between him and and mm-hmm. aunt. And it was odd too because I was looking into just research on the people and it it came up that John DuPont was married. Yeah, for a little while. Very short marriage. Oh, okay. So they didn't show the wife at all. And then Mark also had children and was married. So I don't know if that was just at way after this or was it during this time, but they didn't portray any kind of family life other than Dave. There was a girlfriend of Mark's during this time, but his marriage happened after he left Foxcatcher. Okay. And John DuPont's marriage was very, very short. And his wife basically left because she felt her life was in danger. I wonder why. Well, his mother didn't seem very loving. (laughs) (laughs) I, I felt like they kind of put her in as a character as this very offhand trope of the cold mother Uh who explained the crazy son. Yeah. It was too bad because you just saw this classic, oh, my mom never gave me any attention and love. And I'm, I just wanted to prove myself to her and, uh, but I hate her at the same time. Right. And, and, she calls wrestling a low sport. Oh, know? that was so bad. Don't be involved in such a low sport, John. But they, but it was interesting because all the research in, it, in, in the movie kind of show, well, sort of shows this too a little bit, but it said that he really didn't go kind of a little bit more wacko until after she passed. So they said that he had some, men, they believed he had some mental illness, but it really was only when she passed away that he started to be even really more you know, showing signs of mental breakdown. So almost that she kept him in check, that she was a balancing Mm -hmm. force Mm -hmm. rather than the instigating force Mm -hmm. of his illness, which Mm -hmm. is often the case. So it's that horrible trope of moms cause the mental illness when in Mm -hmm. fact it's usually the other way around, that they're the ones keeping it together. They kind of alluded to what would happen in the end because they were always showing him like, like doing military moves and having guns and shooting guns with the police force and the whole weird thing where they got that big arm. He really got a tank. He did get a tank. That was, that was true that he had a tank with a mounted machine gun. Wow. And he would have the police on his estate to train. That was another aspect. They'd go to there to, to practice on the shooting okay. range. And that would make more sense if they kind of, flesh that out a little bit more. Yeah, I want to go back to the sexual tension because the way this movie is structured, it feels like Mark's reaction to this somewhat covert homosexual, certainly presented from John, is the reason he wants to leave Foxcatcher. And without that sexual tension, 
there's no reason for their relationship to have fallen apart, which I thought was, again, kind of a lazy shorthand in this movie. Well, I don't, I didn't, didn't understand. So he went to the championships, then he, he didn't do so well. And then he ate like crazy, you know, in frustration. That's how I took it. And then his brother realized what he had done and kind of got, brought him back from the edge to, you know, eventually win and do really well. And then there was that awkward tense scene where John wanted to go in to see what was going on with Mark and Dave wouldn't let him come. And Mark had this really weird glaring, you know, zoned out look on his face. And, and I'm like, well, it, it was it all just Mark resented John for showing him all the drugs and getting him involved in all this, you know, stuff that kind of detracted him from his sport? Or was it more like you said, more of the sexual side of things and he just felt super uncomfortable i mean there was also the scene where john flat out you know backhands him you know in front of the other players so was there more physical abuse by john to mark and he just kind of had enough but it, it felt very odd that all of a sudden mark just shut down and said i'm out you know so that part of the movie i thought was kind of more vague than it should be Right. And it's hard to understand coming in to watching this wrestling tournament if you don't know what's going on. So that was the Olympic trials and to get your spot on the Olympic team. And this happens today, too. You have to win the best two out of three matches. So Mark loses his first one and, and then he gets all frustrated and furious and he eats all of room service. And then... Dave is like, no, no, you still got a chance. We got to get you back. And he still had to weigh in. So, of course, it's time for the the infamous cutting scene, to which I almost puked myself. <laughs> just, I'm sorry, I can't watch that stuff. So he cut and came down and made the, the Olympics. But I know in the book, this is for the Seoul Olympics. If I remember it correctly, he was tired of DuPont's just kind of layers of abuse directed at him and it may have just been subtle abuse but he basically threw his matches at in Seoul because he didn't want to give John DuPont the satisfaction of having an Olympic gold medalist on his squad interesting well that's how Mark presented in his book yes, right, 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 yes right. exactly that's the spin on why he did so poorly right mm -hmm. and it definitely seemed like the apologist version of what happened in Seoul I mean considering that even Mark admits that in the run up to Seoul he was doing cocaine he was not training the way he should have been um, the whole incident of the what happened at the Olympic trials and him having to cut at the last minute he did include that in the book so isn't it easy to have the excuse? Mm -hmm. And they, they do somewhat present it in the movie where, where DuPont is in his corner at Seoul and he looks at him. Uh, uh, Mark looks at, at DuPont and just kind of stops trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't do this. And the, in, the, in the movie they presented as he comes home from Seoul and leaves immediately. Right, right, right. So in the book, how long did it take for him to leave? Not long. I mean, a couple of months. Okay. It wasn't long. It definitely right, wasn't he right. home from Seoul, kind of got his bearings, figured out what he was going to do next, got a job okay. in Utah and left. Little tiny details there. The guy who was weighing him in at the U.S. Olympic trials was Mark Schultz. Oh, that was his cameo in the in the it, film. It. Yeah, exactly. Then <laughs> I also wanted to know, maybe he had been there long enough, but remember how he, you show up at a mansion and you've got a car full of stuff and you leave said mansion in which you are living in a fully furnished chalet and you leave with a moving truck. Did he walk off with a bunch of John DuPont's furniture? That's what I really wanted to know. What did well, he, he did walk out with that table and he definitely did not come in with that table. Like why <laughs> out of all the items they could have shown Chan and Tatum carrying, it was this royal blue end table. Like, did that make an appearance somewhere else in the movie? Maybe there's a cut scene where that end table has some purpose. 
but it was such an odd object to be holding. Like if he had taken one of the stuffed birds, you know, that had gotten close ups. If he had taken the book, if he had taken the TV, but this blue end table, I'm thinking, <laughs> does he just like that color? What? It's fox catcher blue. Why would you have it remind you of that place? Well, right. It was such an odd item to show him carrying out and, and such a definite choice. Like it wasn't random. It wasn't like they showed him carrying a whole bunch of things. Interesting. I was geeking out through most of the movie at uh, Anthony Michael Hall making an appearance. Right. In this movie. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, is that Anthony Michael Hall? And then I wanted to see more of him and there, he wasn't in a lot of the movie. No. no and, and speaking of cameos, U.S. wrestler Bruce Baumgartner uh, makes an appearance early on. He is one of the USA wrestling officials. Oh, neat. And he actually... Mark Ruffalo, as Dave Schultz, calls him Bruce. Ha. So it it highlights that a little bit. So I thought that was interesting that many American wrestlers and people involved in the story were involved in this movie. Uh-huh. It, it's also interesting that Baumgartner was in the movie and did some of the wrestling coaching prep for the movie because he had been invited to Foxcatcher Farms and did not go because he was really creeped out by John DuPont. And you wonder how many people were invited and had the same feeling and then just opted not to train there just because of that. You know, when we were going through the book and we were talking to Jason Bryant about it, one of the things he talked about as just being part of the zeitgeist of that time was everybody knew John DuPont was creepy, but wrestlers had no place to go. Hmm and had no money and had no facilities and colleges were cutting programs left and right. So what are you going to do? Right. You're going to bite your tongue and deal with creepy John DuPont. <laughs> right. And if you're low enough on the totem pole, you don't even really deal with him. He might show up once a week or whatever, or show up to practice and he's not going to pick up on you, pick on you necessarily. I want to go back to something that you said earlier, Fran, about not liking anybody. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> curious as to why you didn't like Dave. You know what? I don't know. It, he just, I don't know. Maybe it just, it, I don't think they ever focused enough on his character. He just was very peripheral to me. You know, in the beginning, he was just the bigger brother, you know, and then, you know, Mark went out on his own, but then he showed back up, but then he was just kind of more an ancillary character, but then he kind of came to the forefront toward the middle and end of the storyline. But I don't know. I just didn't, I just didn't feel very vested in him as a character. And, and I think that's part of the problem is that the movie is based on Mark's book and Mark wasn't there and there could have been he loved his brother and he constantly said that in the book I love my brother I love my brother but he also could have been feeling a second fiddle and everybody in the wrestling world loved Dave and mm -hmm. that's kind of what I got from this movie is that just in little tiny touches where he'd say hey to somebody or just talk to a whole bunch of people here and there that he liked he he was just beloved but it's really hard when the source material is the main role in the movie, but the event that the movie is supposed to be about isn't about the main actor. Uh. And that's the same problem with the book, especially since Mark wasn't there at the time. Right. He didn't, you know, when, when you have a book that is supposed to be about Dave Schultz's murder, but it's written from somebody's point of view who wasn't there and, and who is... And you can say that about a third party too, but it's written as a first person book. Uh. So I think that for me, that's one of the issues with the movie, just because I think the source material doesn't provide what they needed. And even though the director looked at other things and interviewed other people to get a more fleshed out story, I, I still think that what you're dealing with is a lead character who's not particularly interesting. Correct. And an event that doesn't happen to the main character. Correct. I thought a brilliant moment, very small, is that between Mark and Dave's wife, Nancy, in the hotel room, mm -hmm. where they have that little argument about how Nancy spoke to John DuPont. And 
from what we have read since, the relationship between Mark and Nancy, number one, was never very good. And since Dave's murder has been very strained. Hmm. And I thought that was just an interesting little tell that they put in to acknowledge because Nancy was very involved in the movie. And in fact, the glasses that Mark Ruffalo wears are Dave Schultz's actual glasses. Oh, wow. So I think that little argument and giving Nancy a moment that doesn't seem to make sense, makes sense if you recognize that Nancy and Mark's relationship now is very poor. Well, and that kind of makes sense if you go back to their backstory as children, you know, having divorced parents, moving around a lot, they only had each other. So of course, anyone who's going to pull Dave away from Mark, i.e., you know, his wife, he's going to feel some kind of animosity towards her. So that kind of makes sense. You know, maybe I, you know, I almost felt like Mark almost kind of resented what Dave had. You know, he had that Mm -hmm. loving family. He had those children. He had something to hold on to where Mark just seemed very adrift. You know, he just didn't seem like he was comfortable, wasn't happy with his life. It seemed like he was comfortable and happy training and being with the crew at Foxcatcher, you know, doing doing the wrestling. But for the most part, he Mark just seemed like a very sad, sad character. Until he got those frosted tips. <laughs> Can we talk or, about or the is, hair? <laughs> or as Jill texted to me, his cocaine hair. Yes. <laughs> and I thought it was very odd that an Olympic athlete in training for a major event would all of a sudden like choose to do drugs. Cause I'm like, wasn't there drug testing? I mean, how, Yeah. I mean, how did he think that this was going to end up? You know, it just seemed very odd that he would make that choice. He could have easily said no. In the book, Mark definitely glosses over the cocaine use, third party reporting and stories were that his cocaine use was much more serious Mm -hmm. than what he included in the book. And I guess they sort of glossed over it in the movie because of that. I mean, the, the movie makers are hampered, as Jill was saying, by their source material. I mean, they can bring in external things, but I guess getting frosted tips is like the worldwide signifier <laughs> of I have a drug problem. <laughs> sort of like when girls get the black eyeliner, it's like, oh, they're, they, they've gone bad. If boys get frosted tips, they've either joined a boy band or are taking too much cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, that was, it was just such an odd addition. You know, I know they had to address it in some capacity, but it just it just didn't make sense to me that a premier athlete, you know, still in his prime, still wanting, still having those goals that a competitor has would not throw it away, but, you know, go down a path that could potentially, you know, derail him forever. Speaking of derailed, (laughs) what the ending made no sense. I mean, I understand the context of the ending because we read the book, but as a movie, it was the most unsatisfying ending. Oh, completely. I wanted a trial. I wanted to see what happened afterwards. I wanted to see if like Nancy sued for for money and, you know, what happened? Yeah, we get his one Mark's one MMA fight. And yeah, and and what we don't also don't, see because of a compressed timeline is that there was a big standoff i mean john yeah. dupont hold up hold up in his uh, his mansion for days i mean that they... was more compelling to watch actually mm-hmm. so i don't know why they decided to just have him like look like he was like a weird lost plumber <laughs> in the bowels of a part of his mansion you know, instead of the standoff, because that would have made more sense. You know, when I read that online afterwards, I was like, oh, well, that's a more plausible ending. So, I'm, you know, I was talking to my husband about it and I'm like, well, he was a millionaire. I mean, you With know, tank. 
with a tank. I'm like, of course, I mean, well, first of all, it was interesting because of, of course, his lawyers pleaded insanity, you know, at his trial. And, you know, so I was kind of half joking, half serious in the car with uh, my husband today saying, well, of course he was insane. Why would a millionaire kill somebody in broad daylight, you know, in front of witnesses, you know, when he could have had someone else do it for him? And then afterwards, you know, he could have disappeared. (laughs) So it just was a very odd situation. But I guess that was that kind of encapsulated who John DuPont was. He was odd. He was weird. You didn't know what was going on in his mind. I guess he carried weaponry a lot. I mean, I think there was an episode I read about where he actually accosted another wrestler with a firearm previous to that episode. And the wrestler, I guess, got him to put the gun away and abated the situation. So I I don't think that that was the first time he pulled a gun on someone at Foxcatcher. And once again, we get a transformational hairdo from Channing Tatum. (laughs) Somehow, I guess he has the redemptive bald head now at the end. I, I didn't understand any of that ending sequence where they show him going into the MMA fight with the shaved head. And yet it was so definitive. I mean, there was nothing accidental about y- using that story and, and that physicality. And yet it made no sense. It didn't make any sense. I kind of wonder what the director's cut is like. Mm. It was originally four hours long. No, not going to watch it. No way. You couldn't pay me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather watch more of gold. <laughs> well, at least there we got song and dance man and, and the other side of the mountain part two <laughs> <laughs> you know what i thought was so interesting was how unattractive both channing tatum and mark ruffalo were in this movie both right were very attract i mean especially china channing tatum i happen to be a mark ruffalo fan how truly attractive they are and charismatic right and in this movie, they're not. They're very flat, very flat affects. And in pictures, looking at pictures of the Schultz brothers, they were more good looking, I felt, than the way they were portrayed in the film, especially Dave. The hair and the bald spot. And the stance, their physicality mm. was, was, it was ugly. so it was ugly. apish. Which I, I know a lot of wrestlers have that sort of heavy movement and slouchy movement but it felt like really we're gonna knuckle drag these guys wow it seemed very pronounced that they came across as just almost like these dummies you know when i didn't feel like that really did them probably any justice i mean to win a gold medal i mean you have to be i'm assuming pretty intelligent and know know what you're doing know what you're capable of you know, have that, have a fire within you. And I didn't really see any of that portrayed in the movie. And that may be hard because maybe we didn't see whatever fire got Mark to that gold medal in in Uh 84. And you're dealing with the aftermath of what next? And Uh yeah, I've got another four years in me, but I'm also looking at the life of a pauper. Uh And yeah, and dealing with that could be that post Olympics depression Blues, that we yeah. hear a lot of Olympians get. So and we didn't even get any really good Olympic montages in this movie at all. And no, no. training montages, no really. Training montages. We didn't get any Olympic fanfare that we could critique and make fun of <laughs> for its inconsistencies. <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, to be fair, you know, I, I complain about tropes, but this w- did not have any. Uh, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. That we have come across on Correct. so many of the others. Right. And I, I got to say props to the makeup artist who gave Mark cauliflower ears as the movie went on. Because you saw at the end, they just kept getting more cauliflower ears. Mm. And like, wow, they did a really good job at showing that progression of physicality. Mm-hmm. Throughout things. So. Mm-hmm. I know. I don't think it. Well, obviously, it's not a movie for everybody. But <laughs> I think if you know the uh, know something about the story, it, you can bring more to your viewing experience than you get going in cold. Yeah, it would have been interesting to have read Mark's book 
before. No, no, it wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody else has booked that, perhaps. The only thing that saves this movie for me were the absolute tour de force performances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was incredible acting. There's there's absolutely no question. I mean, you really did not see, like you said, you didn't see handsome Channing Tatum and charismatic Mark Ruffalo or, you know, anchorman Steve Carell. I mean, you saw real, you know, guttural, visceral people portrayed on the screen. So I really kudos to them. I really they they really did a great job of what they were trying to do. But maybe like you you guys said, it was just the source material and, you know, what they had to work with just really wasn't, you know, something that really engaged, you know, me as a as a as a viewer. Well, I think we'll end it on that note. Thank you, Fran. Hopefully our next selection will be much more interesting. But yeah, I don't know. Creepy, creepy movie. Yeah, but, no uh, more creepies. Let's get some heartwarming <laughs> tropes going next time. <laughs> Except our next one is called Murder Ball. <laughs> <laughs> but there's probably a lot of heart in that movie. <laughs> we'll find or, out. Or hearts getting ripped out like that Indiana <laughs> Jones film. I sense we're on a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of those years, I guess, because we're ending with I, Tanya also. <laughs> All right, Fran, thank you so much. We really appreciate it as always, and we will see you again soon. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Fran. We asked on our Facebook group what some of our listeners thought, and a lot of them had seen the movie when it came out, which was interesting. And a lot of people said creepy. <laughs> which is true. I mean, Steve Carell really portrays a very creepy DuPont. Yes, and it seemed like listeners were confused as we were. Right. Both on the story and both as a story and as a movie. Right, because uh, listener Patrick said uh, he would have liked more of the Schultz backstory in the movie after reading the book. Listener Nicholas and uh, contributor Ben and listener Manu all talked about how there was a lot of literary license taken with the movie. So that also makes it tough. How do you reconcile those two? What what what's entertainment versus what's remembering a, a story or a piece of history? Well, going back to our very first movie club, we talked about truth versus fact. Mm hmm. And I don't know how well this movie conv conveyed the truth. And it certainly played fast and loose with facts. Right. And not in a fun gold kind of way, because gold was such a fun a fun movie to watch and you got caught up in the spirit of winning that gold medal and the spirit of India's independence that uh, you, you forgave a lot of the non-facts. Because at any point, if anybody wants to break out into song about champagne, I am there for them. <laughs> but here, I mean, you're dealing with a much heavier story. Right. That would not be appropriate. Right. <laughs> Though I'm sure that Channing Tatum, with his cocaine hair, could have burst out into an interesting song. <laughs> yeah. But I'm happy to note, despite the title, I think our next movie is going to be a lot cheerier. Exactly. We are going to watch Murder Ball, the 2005 documentary about wheelchair rugby players vying to go to the Athens Paralympics. So we will be... Talking about that just ahead of the Tokyo Paralympics to help prepare you for those and get you in the mood. It's supposed to be excellent, so I am looking forward to watching it. And it is available as Prime Video in the U.S. on Amazon. Okay, good. So if you've got that service, right. it's easy and to find. I believe it's also on YouTube. And it's interesting. I don't know where you are, a listener, but I found that I watched Foxcatcher on an app called Tubi, T-U-B-I, and I found that through my on-demand through my cable service because I still have cable TV, but they, you can find these, these movies uh, sometimes anywhere. Uh, we'd like to take a minute to thank our supporters. They help defray our expenses, especially in the run up to our on the ground cover coverage in Beijing, which I recently made the first of four hotel payments, which was a little, that was an experience. So I'll get used to it. 
If you value this show and the work and the work we put in to bring it to you and have the means to support us financially, we'd appreciate your support. You can become a patron at patreon.com slash flame alive pod for an ongoing donation, or you can look for our Kickstarter coming out during the Tokyo Olympics. If finances are an issue for you, that's cool. We can you can still support us by writing reviews on your podcast app of choice, joining our Facebook group, or joining in on our conversations on Twitter and Insta, and also telling friends about the show. Thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate all of you listening every week. Join the family. Welcome to Shuklistan. Speaking of Shuklistan, it is time to check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. Uh, at the USATF Throws Contest this past weekend, Deanna Price placed third in the hammer throw. Her throw of 75.88 meters was less than one meter behind first place. Gymnast Chelsea Memel returned to competition this weekend at the U.S. Classic. She competed in only vault and beam, so her overall placement was 37th. But the good news is that she petitioned USAG to compete at U.S. Nationals, and she's been accepted. So we will see her again at the end of June. It was so exciting to watch her. It her really vault was fantastic. She had one fall on the beam, but otherwise the beam routine was beautiful. She put in all the difficulty. And Nastia Lukin, our personal friend, was very upset about her uh, beam score, that she had been underscored. And I had to agree. I did too. And she was just, you could see the nerves on her face and then like some of the relief that she did what she kind of set out to do, especially in the vault. She was just so thrilled with her vault. And and that was that was a vault that was upgraded for her. Oh, nice. Because, it, you know, the gymnastics has progressed. That mm -hmm. was in terms of that was a world class vault is my point in current gymnastics. And she it was well done. She deserves it. Laura Wilkinson recently competed at a diving meet at Northside Swim Center. It was her last tune-up before trials, which are coming up soon. All of the big the big U.S. Olympic trials are happening within the next month or so. And it's amazing we're uh, getting also emails from Australia about all these teams that have been named. And it's so exciting. Like almost every day we get like another team named email and Great Britain's name and a whole bunch of teams. And all these places are coming out with their team names and... I'm seeing on Twitter all these National Olympic committees are talking about their athletes who are going to be going. It's getting really exciting. And Samantha Schultz won her seventh U.S. Modern Pentathlon Championships this past weekend. And we will have a link to the replays in the show notes. So because it is Memorial Day weekend here, we're going to make this show a little bit shorter and uh, call it a day. Get, Get kinda... that barbecue fired up. That's right. Barbecue fired up. White clothes. And for me, a bib to cover <laughs> to, to, to hold that barbecue sauce. <laughs> That'll do it for this week. Let us know what you think about Foxcatcher. Email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. We're Flame Alive Pod on Twitter and Insta and keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. Join us next week for our discussion with shot put gold medalist Michelle Carter. It was a good one. You, you will not want to miss this. So as we go out to music by Archdale, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive. Channing, Channing Tatum. 
I can't remember. It's two names that sound good either way. <laughs> Channing Tatum. <laughs> two great tastes that taste great together. 